Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Marquis, and I'm the director of the Coalition for Life Sciences. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. Um, it's also the start of our 25th season of hosting Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus briefings. And in a wonderful twist of fate, we got the very first speaker of our very first caucus here to commemorate our 25th, start our 25th year. So Dr. Bergman was, what, just a postdoc back then, right? <laughs> so welcome back. Um, I'd also like to thank our co-chairs of the caucus, Representative Steve Stivers from Ohio, Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Jackie Spear from California, and Rush Holt from New Jersey. It's due to their commitment and dedication that we are able to host these scientists from across the country and highlight the amazing cutting edge research taking place across the country. Um, as I mentioned, we will be hearing from Dr. Corey Bargman today. She is of the Rockefeller University in New York City. Dr. Bargman received her undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Georgia. She received her PhD in 1987 from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, otherwise known as MIT, where she worked under Dr. Robert Weinberg at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. She pursued a postdoc fellowship with Bob Horvitz, also of MIT, until 1991, where she accepted a faculty position of the university at the University of California, San Francisco. She remained there until 2004 when she joined Rockefeller as the Torsten Wiesel Professor. Dr. Bargman is also co-director of the Shelby White and Leon Levy Center for Mind, Brain, Behavior, Mind, Brain, and Behavior. She has been an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1995. Dr. Bargman is a member of the National Academies of Science, the American Philo Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received numerous awards for her research. Dr. Bargman is an accomplished neuroscientist who studies C. elegant worms in order to determine the relationship between genes, the nervous system, and behavior, which on its own would be a very interesting talk for us to hear. But today, she is here as her role as co-chair of the NIH Working Group, created to establish direction for the BRAIN Initiative, BRAIN standing for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. The initiative was announced by President Obama on April 2, 2013, and it aims to revolutionize our understanding of the human mind and uncover new ways to treat, prevent, and cure brain disorders like Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, aut autism, epilepsy, and traumatic brain injury. And so with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bargman today. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you to this group for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here speaking to you today. And I'm speaking to you about my favorite topic, the brain. The human brain is an absolute miracle of nature. It's responsible for our thoughts, our perceptions, our emotions, our decisions, and our actions. And the human brain is also a biological organ made up of billions of nerve cells. And the fundamental question of neuroscience is, how do those individual billions of nerve cells communicate with each other to generate meaningful, complex patterns of activity? And how are those meaningful, complex patterns of activity converted into our thoughts and memories and emotions and behaviors? And this fundamental question went through a great um, burst of energy and excitement just in the past year, when on April 2nd of last year, President Obama announced the beginning of the BRAIN initiative, with BRAIN being an acronym for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. This is a private, public, cooperative venture. The major groups that were signed on to it in the initial announcement included three different government agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Defense Research Program Administration, DARPA. But from the very outset, it was conceived as something that would tie together not only these government research funding agencies, but also private institutions dedicated to brain research. And these include, for example, Paul Allen's Institute for Brain Science in Seattle, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Janelia Farm Virginia campus that does neuroscience research, as well as foundations interested in neuroscience like the Kavli Foundation and the Salk Institute and researchers in America and potentially around the world. 
So what is the BRAIN initiative? So the key words in the BRAIN initiative are research and innovative technologies, trying to put these things together for a new understanding of the brain. And the way this program was announced and described to us was that what we were trying to do is to use research to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action, to understand how we think and learn and remember. Now this is a really audacious big picture goal. And this man here, Francis Collins, on behalf of the NIH, decided that to think about this goal, we needed to go outside of the usual planning process and call together a lot of scientists to um, voice the goals and the best means to achieving those goals. And it's on behalf of that group of scientists that I was invited today. This is a working group of the advisory committee to the NIH director. It consists of 15 scientists, and these scientists come from all kinds of disciplines. So I'm a geneticist who works on very simple brains, trying to understand the relationship between genes and behavior. Other members of the committee are people who work on human brains, who directly do surgery on human patients or on human paralyzed patients to try to help them um, develop new capabilities. There's a physicist on the committee. There's an engineer on the committee. There are people who are mainly in mathematics and computation. And this group together is trying to really understand the big questions in neuroscience and what's possible. And my talk today is to give you a perspective on where this planning process has gone, how we're thinking about what the Brain Initiative is doing. I'm telling you the conclusions of this working group, but it's also very much filtered through my own sensibilities and what I think is important. Now, um, 2013 has been a big year for brain research. First we have this announcement from the president, and then in Europe, in October, there was the launch of a major project in brain research called the Human Brain Project. This project is based in Switzerland, and it's funded at 1 billion euros over the next 10 years, a tremendous responsibility um, um, allocated by the European Commission as a trans-Europe initiative. And the Human Brain Project is, a, is also a project to understand the brain. It's got a very different origin and a different goal. The goal of the Human Brain Project is to develop a computer simulation of the human brain to try and put together complex computer systems that act like brains. And it started with something called the Blue Brain Project developed by IBM, which um, grew out of Watson, if you remember IBM's computer that played Jeopardy and the idea that we could develop smarter and smarter computers that would be more and more brain-like. So why is this happening? Why is there so much excitement? Why is there so much interest and intensity on neuroscience research in these two different endeavors at this time? So I would like to say that from the point of view of the National Institutes of Health, who I report to, and I think also from the point of view of many people in this room, one of the most important reasons to learn more about the brain is the widespread prominence of brain disorders that really drastically curtail many people's lives. And I have listed here some of the different brain disorders that affect many, many Americans and many people around the world. They come in many different categories. What they all share in common is that they affect the way the brain works and cause people to lead less successful lives than they would otherwise lead. At some time in their life, one out of three Americans is going to suffer a debilitating brain disorder from this list. The people on this list are your parents, your children, your friends. So for example, if we start with something like Alzheimer's disease, there are currently 5.6 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. If we look at disorders like schizophrenia, a tragic thought disorder, there are probably about three million people in America who suffer from this disease. Um, these tend to be diseases of the elderly, the degenerative disorders, the thought and mood disorders strike people in their teens or their 20s. And th throughout their lives, people are struggling with these disorders, like depression, for example, or schizophrenia. Going back even earlier, young children suffer from brain disorders like autism that cause them to have problems in communicating, problems in relating to other people. And children also suffer from, for example, seizure disorders and learning disorders that really make it hard for them to succeed. And finally, some of you may wonder why DARPA is so interested in the brain initiative, the Defense Department. The Defense Department cares passionately about the brain because they have seen that both 
active soldiers and veterans are suffering incredibly from brain disorders. That more soldiers died because they committed suicide in the last couple of years of the Iraq and Afghanistan endeavor than were killed in enemy actions. And that increasingly disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury are being seen by the veterans hospitals as something that needs to be dealt with. The Defense Department needs to do something about. Now, there is on this list cause for promise in some of these areas. There are some of these brain disorders where we have pretty good treatments and pretty good interventions. I'd like to highlight Parkinson's where we have pretty good drugs. Depression, probably about 50% of depressed people we have drugs that can treat. Um, there are drugs that control epilepsy. But for many, many of the disorders on this list, we do not have any really successful intervention. And we have been stuck for a long time. So for example, just to give you a couple of these sobering examples, in schizophrenia, there was just a very large scale study called the Katie study to try to look at the improvements in schizophrenia drugs. Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical companies, have been devoting billions of dollars to trying to develop better <coughs> drugs for these disorders. But what they discovered is that effectively, we don't have a more effective drug for this disorder than we had in 1970. We have somewhat safer drugs, but we have really hit a wall. And Alzheimer's disease is an even more serious example. There have been 12 major clinical trials put on by drug companies, by um, biotech companies, by pharma, to target Alzheimer's disease over the past decade. And they all fail to show an, an appreciable improvement for people by the time they reach the middle stages of Alzheimer's disease. This is a tragedy. This is really sobering. So we need to do better. And I would say, when I think about why I want to understand the human brain from the experimental point of view, from the US Brain Initiative point of view, and not from the simulating brains in a computer point of view, these are the things that come to my mind. I want to know why real brains go wrong, and I want to know what to do about it. And the, the pharmaceutical companies are actually now starting to get out of brain research. And if you ask them why, it's because they know that what they have been trying does not work. You can't do a 13th clinical trial using the same method for Alzheimer's that you tried for the last clinical, 12 cl clinical trials that failed. You need a new idea. And I know that James Sabri from Genentech came and talked to this group last year to talk about how drugs are developed in the pharmaceutical industry. And what he said was that if there's good science, then the drugs will succeed. And if the science is not good, then they can't. And so if you ask the pharmaceutical companies or Genentech why they aren't doing more, more research into these disorders, they say, because we don't know enough about the brain. We need to know more about the brain. There are two ways to do that. One is to target each of these disorders individually. And that's a really important part of what the NIH does. But looking at this, looking at the fact that we've hit a wall on so many of these disorders, the alternative is to really try a new idea and a new approach. And that approach is to try to look at the whole brain, to try to really understand how the brain works normally, to cast a very broad net, and to use that as a starting point for later research on specific diseases. So instead of looking for our keys under the lamppost, taking the few clues we have to try and turn on the lights broadly across the brain and see how the brain really works. And in research, that approach has a really great history. And um, Lynn mentioned that I was here in 1990 to talk to you about basic research. And it, the example that I was talking about then is something that's really relevant to this discussion. So in the 1980s, the US made a decision that the way to study cancer was not to try to study just individual cancers, but to cast a broad net and to understand as much as we could about cell growth and cell division and every possible kind of cancer and to learn whatever we could scientifically. And I, as a graduate student at MIT in Bob Weinberg's lab, was part of that endeavor. And there were people still working on main cancers of, of people, but then there were a lot of people exploring. And I was one of the people exploring on the margins. I was studying a pretty strange cancer of rats. And it's a kind of brain cancer that humans don't even get. 
But it was really interesting, and it was interesting because in these rats, the immune system could fight off the cancer eventually and cure them. And we wanted to know how could that be possible. So what I did as a student was to find what had happened in those brain cancers, and I found the gene that was changed, and, I, and we realized that the reason that those cancers could be attacked is that that gene was on the surface of the cancer cell. It decorated the cell. So the immune system could find that cancer cell and destroy it. Most genes are inside the cell. The immune system can't see them. So this was a discovery. It helped us understand how those things put together. And that was where I left the field in about 1990. And then um, other researchers took hold of these results and started looking in other areas. So a scientist at UCLA named Dennis Slayman was looking at many, many human cancers. And he said, let's take everything we've learned from all these animal cancers and look at every human cancer we can and see if any of those things are true. And sure enough, the brain cancers in humans don't have this gene changed. It's not important for human brain cancers. But this gene turns out to be affected in certain human breast cancers. And furthermore, it is the most aggressive breast cancers that have changes in this gene, which is called NU, or HER2. And after that, Genentech, James Sabri, who talked to you six months ago, realized that they could put these things together and use the immune system and molecules from the immune system to attack the tumors that have Herceptin changed in them. And they developed an antibody to treat breast cancer based on targeting that same gene that I found in a rat brain cancer that Dennis Lehman then discovered was important in human breast cancers. And there are now millions of women who have been treated with Herceptin. It's one of the first drug therapies developed where we really understood the biology of a tumor, and that led us from the basic science to the human disease, to a human drug, to a human therapeutic that's used today. A partnership between basic scientists, medical scientists, and biotech that led to this kind of a discovery. Now, I'm just one tiny piece of that story. There were hundreds of people involved. So the point is not that I'm so great. The point is that this works. The point is that when you cast a broad net and you really try to understand the science, you can make the progress that you need to make for the medicine in partnership with the doctors, in partnership with the engineers and the pharmaceutical companies. And that's what inspires me to be involved in the Brain Initiative. So why is this such a hard problem? I mean, we know that it's interesting to understand the brain, and we've known for a long time that those were brain disorders on that list. So the problem is that the brain is incredibly complicated. So there are billions of nerve cells in your brain, each of which has activity that's important. There are more nerve cells in your brain than there are human beings on planet Earth. They are connected to each other typically by about 1,000 connections. There are more connections between nerve cells in your brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. This is an unbelievably complex problem to solve. And in the past, we've wanted to study it, but we sort of had two approaches. We could either study very large regions of the brain, or we could study just individual nerve cells. So the way we study very large regions of the brain is by human brain imaging. This is an image of a human brain. You've probably seen things like this. Um, red is when you're showing this person a picture, and blue is when you're playing this person a soundtrack. And what you can tell is that there's a very big piece of the brain that seems to be involved in vision, and a very big piece of the brain that seems to be involved in hearing. But this kind of an image is slow, and it's very coarse. So trying to understand how the brain works by looking at these movies is sort of like trying to understand human history by being in an airplane above the Earth and trying to look down on it. You can tell in a very general way that something important is happening somewhere, but you do not really understand the details. This part of the brain lights up no matter what you're looking at, whether you're looking at a movie, whether you're looking at your child, whether you're looking at a checkerboard. It doesn't give you the information you really need about how the brain sees. Now, the other way that people have been looking at brain cells for about the past 50 years is to record from individual nerve cells to listen in while that nerve cell is talking and to ask when it's talking. And this is done a lot in animals, and it's done some in humans, too. It's done in humans in the context of certain surgeries, for example. And so from that, you can learn that there are all kinds of really interesting nerve cells inside your brain. 
Here's an example of an interesting nerve cell. This graph tells you when that nerve cell starts chattering. This nerve cell is in about this part of the brain here, and it really cares about faces. There are cells in your brain, there are parts of your brain that are really interested in faces. And this nerve cell here really cares about faces only when they're in profile. It isn't interested in faces from the front. And there are other nerve cells that might be more interested in certain people's faces than in others, or nerve cells that like it when your face has kind of got wide set eyes versus narrow set eyes. These things are really interesting. These are really interesting cells. But it's hard to understand how they generate their properties. How did this, how did this cell develop this magical property? How did it learn one face from another? And it's very hard to make the connection between these two. So if trying to study the brain this way is like trying to understand a whole planet and all the human beings from an airplane, um, trying to understand this is by, like trying to understand human history by picking out one random person from somewhere in the world and following them around. And then the next day picking another random person from somewhere else in the world. So one day you get um, a farmer in India, and the next day you get someone assembling iPhones in China. And it's going to be very hard to put that together. And the reason it's hard to put that together, the reason I'm using this analogy about the planet and the nerve cells, is that we know that the way things happen in, on a planet is by people working together. That there are groups of people that you learn things from looking at groups of people doing things together that you don't learn from looking at an individual or at looking from a, from a plane. And that is exactly what we need to do to understand the brain. So, the way the brain actually functions is not as individual nerve cells and not as big blobs. It functions by interconnected nerve cells, sometimes connected locally, sometimes over very long distances. And these are circuits and networks of neurons. So when the brain perceives or feels or thinks or remembers or plans or decides, each of these activities represent something that's happening in somewhere between maybe 100,000 and a million or 10 million neurons that are communicating with each other and picking out information and passing it on. So we can say in a general way, for example, that when I see someone across the room, first that back part of my brain for vision lights up, and then maybe some of the cells, but not all of them, involved in the face region might light up. And then somehow that recruits an area in the middle of my brain where memories have been formed that tells me if I've met that person before. And then um, that in turn might relate to some emotional parts of my brain to determine whether I like that person or not. And then those things together get sent to decision making centers and then action planning centers that will decide whether I go across the room and talk to that person. So each of those areas might have involved a million different neurons. And through that process, maybe 10 million or 100 million neurons were active in a second that information was passed back and forth to allow these decisions to take place. And when we look at the brain disorders, most brain disorders are not defective when we look at the level of single neurons, um, although some are, like epilepsy. And most brain disorders, we don't really see defects when we look at the level of big blobs, although some we do, like after strokes. Most brain disorders seem to fall in the category here, where these circuits and networks are not being hooked up properly. They're not communicating with each other properly. The information is not going down the right paths and making the right traffic. And so the goal of the brain dis initiative is to try to really figure out how these kinds of circuits and networks are transmitting information to allow these complex structures to, take, to, to function, how these thousands of millions of neurons act together. So that brings us to what the NIH working group has decided is really the goal of the brain initiative. It's right now we can't do exactly what we want to do, but we want to be able to develop and apply new technologies so that we can study brains in action, so we can watch that information flow at the level of individual nerve cells to thousands to millions of nerve cells over space and over time. And we really want to study the traffic in the brain, not just the map, not just the big areas. And this is going to be a huge task. And that is why the working group was put together with a variety of different scientists. And we recognize that it's going to require new technologies that currently don't exist. But nonetheless, in the brain initiative, um, we really feel that this is worth doing and we feel that it's important to do. And I just want to say two things about the BRAIN Initiative that, that are important to emphasize. The first is that the BRAIN Initiative is not going to replace disease-based research. 
This is not backing off from studying Alzheimer's for itself. These things remain important, and the Brain Initiative is really just a small fraction of all the research that's going to be done on the brain. Currently, it's less than 1% of what NIH alone is spending on neuroscience, on brain disorders. So don't think this is a kidnapping um, important disease research, but the idea is that it's going to be a big picture initiative to try and shed light that all of these other specific diseases can use that we can try and find the important missing pieces that happen at the level of circuits and networks, and we can build tools and infrastructure for understanding healthy and diseased brains. Why now? So these questions, these ideas that I brought up to you, these are not ideas that got thought up on April 1st of last year so that we had an initiative announced on April 2nd. Um, these are, but the, what makes it possible now to think about them is that there have been huge progresses in neuroscience in a couple of different areas just in the past 10 years that make it look as though we might actually be able to solve this problem. We might actually be able to watch brains in action at high resolution with lots of different nerve cells. And these advances have come from many different fields. They've come from neuroscience itself, but they've come from physics and optics and from genetics and from computer science. And these areas put together are letting us look now at the brain at the level of thousands of neurons at a time instead of just one neuron at a time. And they're making us see that if we did this, if we kept working for another five or 10 years, we could get to that level of millions that we really want to understand the brain. So I just want to show you a couple of really nice examples of advances that have been made in neuroscience just in the past few years that help us to see that we'll be able to see the brain in more detail. <laughs> so the first is that there are now new methods for looking at individual nerve cells in action. I'll tell you when, not yet. Okay, so what is this? I'm going to show you a movie of a brain, of a complete brain, where individual nerve cells light up when they become active. They emit a little flash of night, light when they become active. And so instead of looking at a big blob or at just one nerve cell, you can look across the whole brain of this animal. Now this animal is a fish, it's not a person, but it's a wonderful fish, it's a transparent fish, so you can look just through its brain in a living fish and see every nerve cell. And this trick was possible because of an advance in genetics that made this protein that flashes light when the nerve cell becomes active. And it also became possible because of advances in microscopy that let us capture those, those light flashes and of cameras that allowed us to record them. So if you start the movie, this is a fish's brain at work. And what you can see is that this fish's brain has about 80,000 neurons in it and they're flashing on and off. And sometimes there's a little more over here and then there's something going on back there. And you can see, start to see patterns. You start to see that certain nerve cells are active at the same time and others are not active at the same time. And sometimes there's a big flash of activity where the whole brain becomes active at once. And then it goes back to these more complex distributed patterns of activity. So what do I want to say about this? First thing, um, if we were doing classical human brain imaging the way we do it now, this would be one pixel. The only thing you would have seen in a human brain imaging would have been that one flash of light where everyone went off. Mm -hmm. But clearly there's a lot going on at these other times. Second, we can tell that there are patterns here. We could tell that there were groups of neurons. If you look at this for a while, it's sort of like, oh yeah, there's something going back and forth on the left and right over here. And so we can start to bring into focus that question about how do groups of neurons generate a thought or an action, because we can look at the relationships between them. Now this is 80,000 neurons. One of the big goals of the Brain Initiative is to bring this number up, to be able to look at more and more neurons. So this is a fish. Um, there's just been a paper published showing where in a mouse you can look at a thousand neurons and one of the things that was really cool about that is that they were neurons involved in forming memories and they were able to watch those neurons for a month before, during, and after this mouse <coughs> formed a memory. So you're actually starting to watch an important process take place. And this is something that the Brain Initiative really wants to ramp up. <coughs> And in parallel, I, um, there are other kinds of brain activity, not just these flashes of light. So one of the other things that we've learned about the brain over the past 10 years is 
that the fast kinds of flashes of light, that the computation, the sort of computing aspects of the brain, are supplemented by biochemical processes, neurochemical processes, that are somewhat slower, where there are special cells deep in the brain that are involved in generating things like motivational and emotional states. And these are um, some of, I, one I was thinking about was one that was discovered only very recently. There are a few cells, just 20,000 cells deep in the brain that are important in regulating the transitions between sleeping and waking states. And when those neurons are damaged in dogs or in people, they develop narcolepsy. They can no longer sort of regulate their sleep-waking states normally. Even if the other 10 billion neurons in your brain are fine, they can't compensate for these special 20,000 nerve cells. And so we think that there are certain kinds of special population of nerve cells that are not all the same. They're different from each other. And that in many of these kinds of motivational and emotional states are carrying out these kinds of function from these special nerve cells. And I think those are particularly interesting from the perspective of things like psychiatric disorders. Um, we think that some of these, these kinds of systems may not be working quite right. And then finally, um, there's a new, whole new approach to the brain that's been developed just in the past five or 10 years that's really changing our ability to uh, understanding the brain from just watching the brain to being able to pinpoint what's important in those complex patterns of activity. You saw that fish brain. There was so much going on there. What do those different patterns of activity mean? You know, there were things going on in many parts of the brain at the same time. How can we think about them? The way to ask that question is to be able to regulate activity of the brain independent of its normal pattern of activity. And the method for doing this is a method called optogenetics that emerged from basic science. Um, this group at Stanford was really important in that. And it works as follows. And this should really blow your mind, because it still blows my mind. So this story starts with algae, with pond scum. Little green algae swim around. And when light shines on them, they become active. And um, a group in Germany found the gene from algae that allows them to become active in the light. And these guys at Stanford took this gene from algae, and they put that gene into a rat brain, into just some of the nerve cells in that rat brain. So you now have a completely normal rat brain. You have a normal rat doing all the normal things that a rat does, except when you shine a light on this nerve cell, this nerve cell starts firing. This nerve cell becomes active. You are literally beaming thoughts into the rat's brain. Okay? And by doing that, you can now start to act, ask what happens when different brain regions are active? What are they required for? How do they interact with each other? What other brain regions do they trigger? And um, the movie on the next slide actually shows a really interesting example of that in a brain region implicated in emotion and in social emotion. So um, this is a mouse sitting in a cage, and somebody's just thrown in a random um, rubber glove, inflated. Um, and mice are very territorial, and they have social interactions. When they know there's another mouse in the cage, and they haven't seen it before, they have something called a resident intruder reaction, where they attack the, res the intruder mouse. And if you turn on this movie, you'll see that this mouse is sort of sitting around until you activate that part of the brain that's involved in this um, emotion. And at that point exactly, the mouse suddenly decides that this glove is an intruder. You turn the light off, the mouse is fine again, it's just a glove, you sniff it, what's this new thing in my cage? You turn on the part that's involved in social cognition and territorial behavior, and the mouse launches the glove around again. Okay, so this is telling us something really important. This is one of these populations of neurons deep in the brain that seems to have special activity, slower biochemical activity. And so this is the kind of thing we want to understand. We want to understand how these things get put together. So instead of just watching the brain now, we're pointing to different parts of it and saying, that's what this is important to. So these examples were all set up to give you an idea about why the brain initiative is focusing on the things it's focusing on. These are our scientific goals. These are the goals that I would explain to another neuroscientist as well as to you. Um, we want to know what the cells are. What are the parts of the brain? We want to know how they're connected together, locally and at long range, what their physical connections are. And we also want to know when they're active, what their electrical and biochemical connections are. We want to be able to understand how functions emerge from that, which we can do by perturbing and looking at behavior. 
and we're going to need theory and understanding. We're going to need big data and bioinformatics to understand those incredibly complex systems. So this is a goal. The goal is discovery and insight, Fund foundational circuit principles, but also circuits relevant to human brain function and disease. And I'd like to close this talk by just telling you um, a few reasons for thinking that this idea of studying circuits could really be a valuable thing for the country to invest in and could lead to benefits that we can start to see and would continue to see in the future. So the first is I think that there is real reason for hope because we are already seeing the development of some treatments for some human brain disorders that are built around our understanding of the circuits. We're starting to see that. And a really dramatic and beautiful example is a method called deep brain stimulation that is used to treat Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, as many of you know, will happen because the set of neurons deep within the brain that make dopamine first stop working properly and then die. And so this leads to first trembling, then an inability to generate movement, all kinds of motivational and psychiatric disorders as well. A scientist named Malin DeLong decided to study, at a, just from a basic science perspective, the circuits that these dopamine neurons were embedded in. And he ended up with a diagram that looks like this. And it should look confusing because it is confusing. There's lots of different arrows going back and forth, lots of loops of returning information. But really, conceptually, what Malin DeLong found was that these circuits represented two different systems for movement regulation that were in balance with each other, that had to be in balance with each other. And that, for example, this region would stimulate movements, and this neuron was balanced, that it inhibited it. And when these neurons started to die, this region became much too active. It was way out of balance. And building from that inspiration, um, a surgeon named Benabid in France took an electrode and inserted it into the brain of Parkinson's patients, into this little yellow region here. It's a tiny region. It's a millimeter across. And shut down the activity of these neurons. And now, instead of being out of balance, the two systems come back into balance again. And even though there are fewer dopamine neurons and they weren't cured, the brain can operate normally because this other antagonistic system has been quieted down to help the brain function normally. This, um, it's basically a pacemaker for the brain. It's been used in about 100,000 patients worldwide. It can have incredibly dramatic effects where you turn on the electrode and people get up and walk out of the, their wheelchair. Now, it's not a cure. It only lasts for a certain amount of time. It does require a few of these neurons to still be working. But in terms of really saying circuit-based treatments might be able to do something for brain disorders, I think you know, it doesn't get much better than this in terms of telling us that understanding the circuits can help us to understand and make progress in medicine. And that the basic science, the most basic, basic science about how movements were controlled in monkeys led us to a way of treating a human brain disorder. Second thing to think about, I think that un whenever in science we've really learned something fundamentally new and important, it's led to technologies as well. And medical technologies are important, but I just want to point out that another reason to invest in the brain is that new technologies are being invented now based on what we know about the brain, and there will be more new technologies to come. So I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. And about two years ago on Facebook, Facebook suddenly got really good at recognizing your friends' faces. When you scanned in a picture after a party, it would suddenly start saying, is this Jeff Hinton? And you'd be like, yes, this is Jeff Hinton. OK, so how did Facebook know that? So it turns out that this guy, Jeff Hinton, is a computational neuroscientist from Toronto. And he, was, he knew a lot about how the brain processes visual information. And within your brain, there's a part of your brain in the cortex that divides visual information into these really funny looking blobs. So instead of looking at just one pixel, it sort of looks at a blob. It looks for a bright area next to two dark areas and things like that. I mean, I'm kind of astonished that my brain has cells that care about things like this, but they do. And um, what Jeff did was in, he asked a computer to try to divide up a visual image using these kinds of designs that your brain uses to divide up a visual image. And then he developed a method called deep learning based on how the brain assembles information. And that computer 
method is what allowed Facebook to make these huge advances in face recognition. And similar advances are happening now in speech recognition. So our computers are getting better because we are teaching them to act more like our brains. And there's now a big bidding war for people like Jeff Hinton and people that he trained between places like Google and Facebook and Microsoft because the computer technology people think that the next technologies are going to come from these sorts of um, brain-like computers. And I think if we look at the biotech industry, which grew up in Boston and in San Francisco because the science of basic, neuro, uh, basic biology was in Boston and San Francisco, the next generation of the technology industry will probably grow up where neuroscience is happening. And so I think this is another great reason to be thinking more about the brain. But my last slide and my last point is really this. I, you know, I want to understand the brain for neuroscience. I think we will understand the brain, we'll learn more about technology. I care about neurological disease. My mother and my grandmother both died of Alzheimer's disease. But ultimately, I am a child of the 1960s. I was born in 1961. And the same week as my eighth birthday, this man, Neil Armstrong, walked on the moon. And as a child growing up in that era, it was such an exciting thing to have the space program going on, to have a big scientific program. It inspired so many children like me to be interested in science, in engineering, in discovery. And I think the brain, there's a movie here, I think the brain is our space project. I think that there will be incredible creativity and discovery and wonder. I think landing a man on the moon was a great American accomplishment and it was a great human accomplishment. And I think understanding our own brains is one of the greatest things that we as human beings can do. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time and for your attention. fascinating, uh, this whole project to understand the brain. And my first introduction was when my son was a student at NYU, trying to put computers together to mimic the human brain and working and getting a degree in neuroscience. But I, I, I'm now involved in the world of environmental health, and we're very concerned about how environmental exposures sometimes in utero can affect the function of the brain and what you're doing will give us answers to some of those questions. You know, the, it's not either or. Right. We need to make sure that, that developing infants and even prenatally are not exposed to lead and to environmental toxins. We need to understand what's going on there too. Yes. Um, we do know that those are very important for brain development and for function as well. So, but I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with, there is, there's nothing wrong with pursuing both of these avenues. And I think understanding what is going wrong there and how to go about treating it is also, is also important. Absolutely. And I should say, one of the coolest things about the brain is its ability to repair itself from a lot of insults, right? Um, so there are a lot of things that can go wrong early in development that the brain will try to repair itself from. And sometimes if you, if you know more about how it's supposed to work, you can help it along those paths. And I think that's something else that, that knowing more about what the brain is doing could help us to do. Yeah. I need you to look into the, well, first off, excellent talk. I need you to look into the future a little bit um, for me. So um, a part of what we're trying to do is map the uh, activity of the brain and things like that. And you spoke on how drug companies have now started to shy away from brain research. And so my question is, assuming that we are the new pioneers, the astronauts of the brain, do drug companies go back to cell-based assays or do they start to now uh, look more towards this type of stuff for uh, drug discovery? Well, you know, I think what's great about the private sector is that they, is that they're fast and flexible and that new people grow up. You know, I, I mentioned deep brain stimulation. I would love to think that you could just implant an electrode into any patient with a brain disorder, and if you had the exact right spot, you could just turn it on and, and they'd be fine. Um, so, you know, that might come more from the medical devices industry, for example, rather than from the classical drug industries. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we would find more of these special kinds of neurons that are involved in motivational and emotional states. I mentioned the neurons that are involved in narcolepsy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, maybe that would be more of a classical small molecule drug type approach because you would be imitating some of the activities that they have, which sometimes are activities through neurochemistry. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's those, most drugs of abuse and currently used psychiatric drugs are, are playing with that kind of neurochemistry. So that might happen there. Um, I think there are, other, you know, there are other ways of interacting with the brain that we haven't even really started to think about yet. One of the members of the NIH working group is a man named John Donahue, who is trying to read the signals in human brains as ways of controlling robot arms. Okay? So it's neuroprosthesis, is ways of, of, you know, as, of using your own brain activity to then interact with something that's entirely outside of yourself and to have people who are paralyzed be able to develop self-generated movements. So I think there's potential for a lot of movement and discovery um, in these areas, some in areas that, that we see now and others in areas that we're not even imagining. But I think we're, you know, but I think we've hit a wall with the, we've hit a wall, I think, with the drugs we have. <coughs> so, yeah. You talked about the connectivity of the brain as, as a whole. Uh, but we don't, we still don't understand a lot about the single unit of the brains and the neurons. Uh, for example, you mentioned Parkinson's disease and said that, do you know what's the emphasis on the basic science of how much, I mean, how much money is going to be spent on the understanding the very basics that work for the entire neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders? Yeah, so I, so I am proud to say that I have nothing to say with how the money gets disseminated. And it's actually <laughs> illegal for me to weigh in on that process according to government rules. Um, so as a, as a scientific advisor, I'm quite separated. But I think the important thing, again, is to emphasize that the Brain Initiative, it's a small amount of money, and it wants to make an impact by focusing on this one level. It is not replacing the other initiatives. It's not replacing disease-based research. It's not going to replace cell and developmental biology of fundamental processes like cell death or mitochondria, which are turning out to be incredibly important now in thinking about Parkinson's disease and how that works. My own training is actually in molecular biology. I believe that molecules are in the brain. So um, I think you know, if you st that, that, that these are areas that will continue to be worked on, but that this is, and this is a different kind of project. I would say, for example, to study cell death, we know how to study that. Individual labs can do that on their own. It's not going to require physicists and engineers getting together with biologists to try and develop the next generation of brain recording techniques to solve that problem. So it's, it has a different shape. It's served well by the systems that exist in a way that these new projects need new kinds of interdisciplinary efforts to get over the hurdles for the next steps. I know the working group that you're leading is um, having meetings across the country, or was having meetings across the country to gauge what scientists think should be part of the NIH, because it's correct to be part of how the NIH moves forward in this project. Are you finding common themes, or are you finding 25 different potential ways of addressing this? Um, I would say that we got some pretty clear messages. We had meetings across the country, and we put out an interim report in the fall, and then we ducked. Um, and nobody threw anything at us, which was really a surprise. I mean, so but people did throw us a few pretty clear questions. So one question that was really important is, um, you know, where is the money going to come from? Is this coming out of other areas of science? Is this, you know, are you going to start sacrificing other areas like disease-based research? And the message from that has been pretty strongly no. And actually, I would like to thank all of the staffers who work with Congress people on the new budget that was approved on January that actually led to an increase in the budget so the neuroscience-related institutes of the National Institutes of Health that are supporting the Brain Initiative and provided money for them, new money, to do the Brain Initiative. And I know that times are hard, and I know that people have to make decisions, and it's a huge vote of confidence from you to say that um, the Brain Initiative should be getting support under hard circumstances. So that's, the, that's one question is, like, are you going to gut the rest of neuroscience research to do this? And I think the answer is no. Frankly, I wouldn't be involved if, if that was it, if that was the goal. Um, another question is, um, you can't possibly do this in one year, right? And you know, the answer to that is definitely not. And I think the NIH is trying to think about what it would take to do a larger project and how, you know, what are the good ideas, how would they really do it, how would you continue this out? And that's actually what we're thinking about now, the working group, before our final report. 
Um, I've talked, probably the most um, interesting and fun conversations for me I've had have been with clinicians. So we've been reaching out to um, the, the, the associations of neurologists, of psychiatrists, of different kinds of clinical researchers to ask them, <coughs> what do you think is important? What do you think is missing from that? Um, you know, and some of those have really given us some pretty clear ideas. Uh, for example, the parts of the brain that a neurologist thinks are important are not necessarily the parts that neuroscientists love the most. Neuroscientists love the cortex because it's the smart, clever part of the brain. And neurologists are like, I need to know more about the spinal cord. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of spinal cord patients and pain patients. Um, so we've sort of turned that into a no neuron left behind attitude. <laughs> we really want to understand the whole brain. You know, so there have been, so there have been some, so, so refinement, feedback, other forms of expertise are definitely improving the product. Mm -hmm. And when's the final product in? Um, we're handing it in on June 6th. So it's reporting to, to Francis Collins, our report is due to him then. Mm -hmm.